Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is good to see you today. I'm glad that you're here. Some of our folks are going to be missing by next week, so we'll be an even smaller congregation. But I am glad that you're joining us either here in person or on the line sometime, whether that's now or during the week. A few announcements, as always. Um, the first is that uh, you should have received your Let's Talk feedback form. This is a program that we're running through the church to get some feedback about where we are hoping that uh, the con or where we are hoping that the congregations will go and be in the next couple of years. Um, this is called Let's Talk because it's it's more than just a layout survey. The idea is that then we'll have some conversation about that survey um, and, and actually get conversation going either one on one with me or in a small group of no more than 10 people. You may have received your forms uh, back in the fall, or you may have received them um, online when I sent them to you this week. If you did not receive them and you would like some, please let me know and make sure you get either a hard copy or an electronic version of it. Um, and then please fill it out. Once you fill it out, let me know whether you prefer to do it in a uh, one-on-one -on -one or a small group, and we will go from there. But uh, please start taking the time to fill this out and, and, and really think about what you're saying. Don't just you know, go, okay, well, this one, this one, this one, you know, like how I used to do exams. Um, you know, just you know, pick, pick any random number. You know, actually think about what you're saying we are hoping. Last week, we, uh, or a couple weeks ago at Epiphany, we talked about Star Wars. And last week, I mentioned them again because they were in the bulletin and uh, had some conversation starters, some thinking starters, prompts for you, activities for the week. Uh, this week, we once again have some different ones. And so I invite you to think about those and work through those throughout the week. If you do not have a star word yet and you would like some, um, please let me know and I'll make sure that you get one. A thanks to Beth Talon for doing our tech for us this morning and to Dwayne Filson for playing our music. Our music license number is A6091891, uh, one license LLC, and our music is reproduced with permission. We begin our worship this morning, as we always do, by acknowledging the territory. As we gather together this morning, it is with great respect that we acknowledge the history, spirituality, culture, and gifts of the peoples with whom Treaty 4 was signed, and the Lakota Nation and Métis people who call this area home. We acknowledge the land on which we live, move, and work as land that was first and is still loved by those who care for and nurture Turtle Island. We acknowledge and accept our responsibilities as treaty members, and we pray that what we do here creates a space where all may work toward peace, friendship, and respectful relationships. May it be so. Our call to worship this morning is printed in your bulletin, and as always, you read bold and heart. Come all you who wander, and all you who have found your way. Come all you who doubt, and all you who are sure of the way forward. Come and worship. Come all you who feel unlovable, and all you who know your name is beloved. Come and worship. Come everyone. God has called us all, and so we respond. Come and worship. And so we light our Christ candle today, remembering the call of Christ in our lives to this day and always. Let us pray. God, you know our hearts. You admitted our innermost being and you know our deepest desires, fears, and worries. 
Help us to journey this week into a new awareness of your presence in our lives. Save us from our own temptations so that we may more freely follow you. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is number 218 in Voices United, the Burgundy Book. We praise you, O God. We know that we have failed to make wise decisions before, just as those who have come before us. We are tempted at every turn, both by the outright evil and by the seemingly good before us. We have too often leaned on our own understanding about what is good, rather than trust your wisdom. Inspire us by Jesus' example. Help us to trust you alone in all things and choose your way over our own. Amen. Friends, there is good news for us. And that good news is that no matter how far away we wander, no matter what we may choose to do or not do that takes us off the path of God, we are loved and we are forgiven. We need only turn back to God and God's will. This is the good news for us for every day. We are loved and we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our scripture today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 to 17. And it picks up right after um, the scripture that we had last week. Now, we read from Mark. Um, but the same, it was the same story, the story of Jesus' baptism. So this is picking up right after the dove has come down and the whole, you know, you are my beloved son with whom I am not pleased. Ooh, uh, heaven's being torn apart. This is where we pick up. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was banished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. 
Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to them, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the lake in the territory of Zebulun and Napoli, so that they, what had been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun, land of Napoli, on the road by the sea across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So, are all temptations bad? Because in this story, it kind of seems like it, right? Like we, and the way we always talk about the story is that, you know, Jesus was tempted and he overcame his temptations. Good for Jesus. We should do the same. But it seems to me that it's not about overcoming all temptations. It's about figuring out which temptations to overcome and which ones to give into. Because sometimes we have temptations to do good. And if we say, oh, I'm tempted to do that, you know, that really good thing that will help someone else, but I'm not going to do it because I'm overcoming temptation. Well, I think we missed the point. <laughs> So sometimes, sometimes our temptations can be good. Sometimes they can really not be. And so it's about discernment. It's about learning and, and figuring out within ourselves and within a community often about what is right and what is wrong, where we should go and what we should do and what we should refrain from doing and saying and going. So for today's um, time of all God's children, children's time, whatever you want to call it, I have something that might be a temptation for you. Maybe it's not, but we're going to, we're going to see, because I'm going to give you two different temptations and you get to decide what you do with it. And I'm not going to tell you one way or the other, and you don't have to tell me what your answer is, but I brought some chocolate for us. <laughs> They're called Merci chocolates. Basically, I went to the co-op and went, what thing has multiple chocolates in it that are individually wrapped so that I can give them out? Um, I think, oops, I think they're pretty good. Anybody had these before? Yeah, they're pretty good. Okay, there's all sorts of different kinds. So one temptation, I'm gonna give everybody one of these. One temptation could be that we eat it ourselves. And one temptation, to be that we give it to someone else to brighten their day. I'm not gonna tell you which one to do. You can figure out for yourself. And I'm not even gonna tell you which is wrong and which is right, because sometimes we just need that chocolate, right? You know, if I have a migraine, if I, if I have a migraine and I'm not feeling so great and I don't have any other you know, any other Advil or anything like that. And somebody gives me a piece of chocolate and says, well, you're supposed to give it to somebody else. I probably wouldn't give it to somebody else because in that moment, that chocolate will help me. And maybe that is the right thing in that moment. But maybe it's not. Maybe the right thing in that moment is to give it to someone else. And it's, it's not a, because when we are tempted, it's not a, easy black and white we always know the answer it's about figuring it out for ourselves it's about talking about it with others it's about talking about it with god so here's some chocolate you figure out what to do with it would you like some chocolate sure 
Well, how am I supposed to get this over? Well, clean up pretty easy when you're out there. <laughs> and we'll pass it along here and then we'll pass it around. For those of you who are on the screen, well, you'll have to go buy your own chocolate and then decide what to do with it. Our next hymn is going to be number 115 in Voices United, Jesus Tempted in the Desert. In the interest of transparency, I want to let you know that the majority of what I'm about to say comes from a sermon given by Henry Nowen in 1992 at the Crystal Cathedral in California for an hour of power broadcast. I'm not using his exact words, but certainly his framework and his thoughts were central to my work. Henry's sermon was called Being the Beloved, and if anyone wants the link to where I found it, I will gladly pass it along because I'm pretty sure he says it better than I will. So if you would like to hear uh, what Henry Nowen has to say, I will gladly give it to you. But we begin pretty much where we left off in last week's children time, children's time. You, I, and we, are the beloved daughters, sons, and children of God. So my question for you, you don't have to answer, hey, there you go, I was just gonna say, what did you do with your name tag? <laughs> and you don't have to answer, Penny is showing us that she put her name tag on her water bottle. 
But I wonder what the rest of you did with it. You don't have to answer out loud if you don't want to. But what did you do with it? Did you wear it till it just fell off naturally because they're not really sticky stickers? <laughs> and you lost it and you didn't even notice that it fell off? Did you take it off and, and carefully place it somewhere special, like a water bottle? Did you casually remove it and throw it in the garbage because it's just a little sticker and what in the world was y'all talking about anyways? Is it somewhere that you see it daily? Somewhere that you'll find it on special occasions? Or somewhere that you'll just never see it again? The question is, what do you do with your belovedness? Because that is core to our faith. You, I, we are created in the image of God, claimed by God as beloved children and commissioned by God to live into that calling for the good of the whole world. You are a beloved child, son or daughter of God. And one of the hardest challenges of our spiritual life is to remember that truth and live as if it were so. It is so difficult because it gets the core of who we believe ourselves to be and what we tell ourselves about who we are. It's a question that we ask throughout the entirety of our years that we have on this earth. Who am I? And the first way that we often answer that question of who am I is with I am what I do. We define ourselves by our work, by our abilities, or by our capacity to be productive in this world. Have you ever noticed that's one of the first questions that we ask when we meet someone new? What do you do? We call it an icebreaker, but really it is getting to the core of who we think we and others are. We pride ourselves on how much we can do in a day or a week or a year or a lifetime. And we equate being busy with being worthy. When we do much, achieve much, when we have a wall full of trophies or degrees, when our efforts produce much fruit, we find ourselves elated and excited and proud of what we have accomplished. And when we find that we are no longer able to do, either due to age or disability or circumstance of life, we often find ourselves falling into despair and sadness because our idea of who we could and should be has exceeded our ability to actually do it. The second answer that we give to the question of who am I is often, I am what other people say about me. Does that sound familiar? We put the power over who we believe ourselves to be into the hands of another, taking what others say and wearing that as a badge of honor or a sign of shame. When others speak well of us, we hold our heads high and go confidently through the day, believing that who I am must be a good person as we walk on the peaks of the mountains. When even one person in a thousand, though, says something differently, suggests that we are stupid or bad, or starts talking about us behind our backs, our picture of ourselves can change quickly, and we can find ourselves once again in the land of misery and depression. The third way that we answer the lifelong question of who am I is with I am what I have. I have a family, a job, a home, safety, love. And on the surface, some of those things don't seem so bad to build our life on. I am a father, I am a wife, I am Canadian, I am a sibling. But when those get taken away and loss is an inevitable part of life, we find we are left floundering for the answer to that age old question, who am I? Because my child has left home and I don't know what I am if I'm not their parent in the same way that I was when they lived under my roof. My parent has died and I don't know how to interact with the world when I'm not their child. I've lost my house, my job, my prized possessions and with it my sense of worth. 
Again, our identity is tied to some outside influence and how we feel about who we are fluctuates with the circumstances of our life. A lot of energy is put into answering the question, who am I with these beliefs? I am what I do. I am what others say about me. I am what I have. That's the way that this world of ours teaches us to define ourselves and our worth. It's what we're tempted by, because so often we see no other answer. But Jesus gives us another answer in this story, because these ways of defining himself and his worth are exactly the temptations he faces when he's in the desert with the tempter. You're hungry, the devil says, so show us you can do something about it. Turn these stones into bread, eat, and be satisfied. I am what I do. Then they went to the top of the temple, the busiest religious site in all of Judaism. And the tempter says, throw yourself off of here and let the angels catch you. Then people will speak well of you. Did you hear about Jesus of Nazareth? God loves him so much that the angels were sent to lift him up. He must be special. Maybe we should listen to him. I am what others say about me. Here are all the kingdoms of the world, the devil says in the final temptation. You can have control over all of them if you just bow down and worship me. I am what I have. And Jesus' response is that that's a lie. Those things do not make me any more or less loved by God, he says. I am not more worthy because I have lots of things and people speak well of me and I can do miracles. I know who I am because God has already told me. The Spirit has already told me that you are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. It was on that truth that Jesus built his life. It was on the basis of that truth that Jesus was able to turn away from the temptations of his time in the desert. Some people loved him throughout his life, and some people hated him. Some praised him and worshipped him, and some crucified him. Sometimes he did miracles that astonished thousands, and sometimes he could do no miracles at all. Sometimes he had no place to rest his head at night. And sometimes the costliest of perfumes anointed his head and feet. But those moments did not define him. In all of them, he held on to the truth that is beyond all truths. I am the beloved of God. And friends, what is said of Jesus is also said of you. You are the beloved of God. Do you hear that? Not, not just with your ears and your brain, with your heart and your gut. You are the beloved of God. Because when you know that, how you live your life changes. How you answer the question of who am I changes. You will still have moments of praise and moments of pain, moments of rejection and moments of elation, but you will no longer stumble from one to another seeking meaning and identity in them. Our identity and our meaning come from God. John says, beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Isaiah reminds us, see, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands. I have told you by name, you are mine, you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Our psalms sing out that God knit me together in my mother's womb, and that we need not be afraid because God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. All through the pages of our scriptures, we are reminded again and again of God's great love for us as a human race and as individuals. And we hold on to that truth with our whole being. 
When we let this truth, when we know this truth, when we let it sink down into the very depths of our souls, it changes how we live our lives. Because if I am the beloved of God, then it means that you are also the beloved of God. And it means that the person that I like the least in this world is also the beloved of God. And how I interact with the world has to reflect that reality. So it's hard. Because the temptation of this world is to forget this fundamental truth and live as if who we are is relying on what we do, what others say about us, and what we have. That seems so much easier, but it is not true. And so we hold on to the example of Jesus who has showed us another way. And the words of the Spirit of God, the one who named us at the beginning and calls to us even now. We allow that blessing, that truth, that hope to wash over us as the baptismal waters, to fulfill, to fill us completely as the nourishment God provides. We whisper them to ourselves and our children so that we know our identity and we shout it from the rafters so that others know theirs. You, I, we are the beloved of God. Never forget. As a community of faith, we proclaim our faith in the words of a new creed. And so I invite you to join with me in these words. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect and creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. We are called beloved and gifted with grace upon grace. And so we respond to that love and to that hope and to that forgiveness and to that grace with all that we have and all that we are. Sometimes that looks like our time and our talents and our treasure. So whatever it is that you bring to God this day, I invite you to think about it now as we sing together our operatory hymn number 81, or as it's printed in your bulletin, as, uh, as with gladness, men of old. Holy One, you call us beloved, each and every one. You walk with us in the moments of deep elation, 
the moments of pure understanding, the moments where we know and feel your love most dearly. And you also walk with us in our desolate places, in our desert places, in our wilderness places, the times when we are unsure of our belovedness, the times when we are tempted to forget, to define ourselves the way the world does. Be with us, God. Hold our hands, hold us close, remind us of your love. Help us see you and your way in our lives. We pray for ourselves, for our neighbors, for our community, for our country, and for our world. Because there are so many places, God, that need our help, that need your help, that need your spirit of life. There are people we know who are in need of peace and presence and healing and love. There are places in our world that are torn apart by violence and war and need to hear your word of peace, your word of belovedness within their walls. God, help us. Help us to be tempted by the good in life, to be tempted to share your love, to share what you would have us do to help one another, to do what is right in your eyes. Help us to resist the temptation to what is not right, to resist the temptation to forget ourselves, to resist the temptation to do harm to others. To resist the temptation to put others above you. God, hear our prayers. The ones that we say in the depths of our being. The ones for our world. For our neighbors and our loved ones. And for ourselves. In your time. And in your mercy, answer, we pray. God, you have heard our prayers. Help us listen for your response. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, our elder brother, our guide, our savior, and our friend. And so we use the words that he taught his friends and disciples so long ago that have been passed on to generations so that we share them today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and glory, forever and ever. Our final hymn this morning is number 356 in Voices United, Seek Ye First the Kingdom. <laughs>
Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Be tempted by the good. And always remember that you are the beloved. And as you go, may you go with the blessing and the love of God, who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Jesus, who is our elder brother, and the Holy Spirit of life within you this day and evermore. Amen. <laughs>